Hello Mila, hello Jack. Hello everybody else who's watching. Welcome to Storytime with Grandad. Today's book is from Postman Pat and it's Postman Pat and the Harvest Parcel. It had been a good summer in Greendale. In the valley, the fields of barley were golden ripe by the end of July. Pat met Peter Fogg on his way home. You'll be wanting to get this barley in while this good weather lasts, said Pat. I'm going for the combine first thing on Monday, said Peter. Thanks for telling me, said Pat. I'll be on the lookout for you. The combine harvester is so big that nothing can get past it on the narrow Greendale roads. Cars and vans and tractors have to get into a lay-by or gateway to let the combine go past. It's as big as a house and the driver sits high up on top like a captain on his ship. When Katie and Tom heard the combine was coming, they were very excited. Sometimes Peter would give them a ride in it, so high up that it was almost like flying. And later they could play lovely games with the bales of straw, jumping and hiding and making straw houses. The school holidays had just begun, so they could play all day. There would be jugs of homemade lemonade, a new strawberry jam and picnics by the hedge. They could hardly wait till Monday. Peter had to bring the combine from Pencaster, so he set off very early on Monday, before anyone else was awake in Greendale. Pat met him on the way back, just by the sharp bend up the hill from Greendale Farm. Pat had two seconds to get his van into the gateway when Peter came thundering past. Morning, Peter, shouted Pat. Peter didn't hear a word, but he gave Pat a wave. Pat followed the combine to Greendale Farm and stopped behind it in the yard. When, he, when she was sure it was safe and everything had stopped moving, Mrs Pottage let the twins out. They danced around Peter, both talking at once. Can we have a ride? Can we, can we come and watch? Can we have a picnic? Can we drive? Can we? Can we? Peter's was all in a whirl. His ears were buzzing with the engine noise as well as with the twins' noise, so it was no wonder he looked dizzy. Now, you two leave Peter alone till he gets his wits back, said Mrs Pottage. And if you're very good and very careful and do just as you're told, we'll all go to the field and see the combine and have a picnic. And I'll come when I've delivered all my letters, said Pat, and give a hand with loading the bales. I'll bring my sandwiches too, and I might save you a chocolate biscuit. Oh, goody, shouted Katie and Tom. But Peter's going first without us, said Mrs Pottage. And we're not going until he's done at least half the field, and there's a good safe part to play in. They're dangerous things, these harvesters, and we don't want any accidents. Ah, said Katie and Tom. One word more, and we'll not go at all, said Mrs Pottage. Please, said Katie. Can I wear my new jumper? Mrs Pottage turned to Pat. It's the one Mrs Hubbard knitted for the twins' birthday, with sheep all over it. And one black sheep on the tummy. They just love those jumpers. But you'll be hot, love. Far too hot. Please, said Katie. Oh, very well, said Mrs Pottage. It can go in my basket when you get too hot. Katie and Tom ran to get their jumpers to show Pat. Lovely, said Pat, but I'd best be on my way. See you later. Cheerio. Pat was on his way. He called on the people of Greendale with their letters. He told them about the arrival of the combine at Greendale Farm. He called at Burke Howe Holiday Cottage, where Mr and Mrs Cunliffe were staying for the week. Will they mind if we come to watch? asked Mrs Cunliffe. Not at all, said Pat. You'll be welcome. I might be able to put it in my next book, said Mr Cunliffe. We'll bring a picnic, said Mrs Cunliffe. And we can give a hand too. Great, said Pat. Cheerio. Pat called at the church. I'll pop round with my camera, said the Reverend Timms, when I've finished my sermon for Sunday. Now, do make sure they keep some sheaves for the Harvest Festival. Pat called at Thompson Ground. We're too busy with our haymaking to come just now, said Dorothy, but take them a tin of cakes with my love. Pat called on Granny Dryden. 
she was busy parceling up a new jumper to send to little Jasmine in London. Oh, Pat, said Granny Dryden, I've gone and used up all my string, and I wanted to give you this parcel to put in the post today. It'd be in time for Jasmine's birthday. Now what shall I do? Don't worry, said Pat. I'm sure to have some string in one of my pockets. Let's see now. Yes, here we are. Just the job. Pat helped Granny Dryden to tie her parcel up with some good post office knots and then popped it in his bag. Then he told her about Peter bringing the combine and everyone going off to join in and give a hand with the harvest. Oh, I love harvest time, she said. Ever since I was a girl, I've never missed it. I'll have to stroll down this afternoon. I'm going to put some scones in the oven. They're just the thing for a picnic. Lovely, said Pat. Bye. Pat called on George Lancaster at Intake Farm. Hard-boiled eggs, said George. I'll bring plenty for everyone. Pat called on Ted Glenn. I know, said Ted. I'll be down with the bailer later on. I hope they keep those children out of harm's way till I've done. Pat called on Miss Hubbard. They'll need plenty to drink, she said. It's jolly thirsty work harvesting. I'll bring some cider and lemonade and a flask of tea on my bike. Better stick to lemonade on duty, said Miss Hubbard. Thanks, said Pat. Delicious. Have some ice, said Miss Hubbard. This is the life, said Pat. Pat went on his way. He went all along the valley with his letters and parcels and his good cat Jess with him. And as his van and his bags became empty, he filled them up again. He collected new letters and parcels from farms and cottages. And he came back along the valley opening the letter boxes, collecting more letters and cards. Then he took them all to Miss Goggins at the village post office. Jim would soon come over from Pencaster and take them away in his van. They would be sorted at Pencaster post office, then catch the train that night at Pencaster station. And off they would go on their way to all the people who were waiting the next day for their postman to call. When Pat had finished all his work for the day, he said, Come on, Jess, time for a bite to eat. Let's see how they're getting on with that combine. It was like a party in the harvest field. They were all there. Mrs Pottage was handing round sandwiches. Granny Dryden was going around with a basket of scones. And Miss Hubbard was pouring drinks. Katie and Tom and most of the children from the village were running and playing in the stubble. The Reverend Timms was taking pictures of everyone. Peter had almost finished cutting the corn. He stopped to join in the picnic and the combine stood quietly at the far side of the field. There was a trailer full of barley and the long lines of straw lying across the field. Just as Pat sat down on a sunny patch of grass with a glass of cider and a newly baked scone, there was the sound of a tractor in the lane. Look out everyone, called Mrs Pottage. It's Ted with the baler. All to the side of the field, please. The bailer came rattling into the field behind Ted, and they all scurried to the hedges. We don't want anyone getting bailed up in a parcel of hay, said the Reverend Tins. Where could we post them, said Pat. To Cornwall, said Peter. Too corny for me, said Miss Hubbard. Oh dear, said Peter, I'd better get, out that, better get that combine and trailer out of the way. The binder rumbled around the field, gathering up the straw that the combine had left. It made the straw into neat parcels and tied them up with string, just like Granny Dryden's parcel. It left the straw bales spread out in lines across the field. When the binder had gone off to the far side of the big field, Katie said, Please, Mum, can we play with the bales now? Well, if you keep over this side and well away from the baler, said Mrs Pottage, promise? Promise, 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 said all the children, and off they went, running and jumping amongst the bales. What lovely things they were to play with. You could hide behind them for hide and seek. You could jump from the top of them. If you asked Pat to help you lift them, you could build straw houses with them. You could build bridges and staircases and castles with them. You could slide down them, sit on them, creep under them and lie on them. The children did all these things, and more, and they had a wonderful time. 
What they had forgotten, but were soon to remember, was that little bits of straw made you itchy and prickly all over, so that you couldn't sit still for one single minute. All the children would find themselves popped in the bath before bedtime. They would cry out when the water stung their scratches. Ow, it stings! And how many mothers would say, I told you so. But smooth sheets and sleepy eyes would soon soothe all that away. And make them forget, and they'd be back tomorrow and all summer long, playing about the fields and the hedges and the barns and the streams and among the trees. It was getting late in the afternoon, and trees were stretching their shadows far out across the great field. More than once Mrs Pottinger called out, Come on, children, time to go home. And more than once the children had shouted, Just a bit longer. Miss Hubbard packed up and rode off on her bicycle with her cider bottles. Clinking down the lane, Granny Dryden was off home to put the kettle on. And still the children played. The mothers came from the village to call their children home, and Katie and Tom were left at last alone, with Pat and Jess snoozing in the sun by the hedge, and Mrs Pottage saying, Now, it really is time to go. Father will be back, will be back from the market and no tea ready for him. She was walking about, picking up sandals and cups and paper napkins and plates and all the things that people had dropped and forgotten. Then she said, Where is Katie, my new woolly? And where's my hat? said Pat, sitting up and rubbing his eyes. Bless me, is that the time? We'll be missing our tea. Come on, Jess, help us to sniff out a hat and a woolly jumper. They searched all among the bales of straw. But search as they might, there was no sign of Pat's hat or Katie's jumper. Mrs Pottage was cross. Miss Hubbard spent a lot of time knitting that jumper. Then you go and lose it. The first day on. Really, Katie? Katie looked as though she might begin to cry quite soon. I have a feeling it'll turn up, said Pat. Remember that time when Katie lost her doll? Detective Pat found it in the end. Hi, what's that? Pat was staring at a bale of straw as he was speaking. Between the ends of the straw, he could see something blue. He poked his fingers into the straw and pulled at the tightly packed straw parcel. What have you found, Pat? said Tom. I'm not sure, but I'll tell you when I get this parcel open. I thought I'd finished with parcels for today. There's no address on it, so it's all right to open it. Pat took out his penknife and cut the string around the bale. He pushed his hand into the straw and pulled out a sleeve, a woollen sleeve. Well, just look at this, said Pat. Is it? said Mrs Pottage. Katie's jumper, said Pat. I think so. Easy does it. Mustn't pull too hard. My goodness, this is a good parcel. Dry your eyes, Katie. Look, there are your sheep. It is your jumper. You must have dropped it when you were playing and then got it bailed up with the straw. It took a long time to get the jumper out of the bale and it needed a good shaking, but it was all right. Just look at that bale, said Mrs Pottage. Dad'll wonder what happened to it when he sees it. What about Pat's hat, said Katie. It might be in another bale, said Tom. They looked at all the bales and felt them and poked them. There was no sign of Pat's hat. Don't be sad, Pat, said Katie. I'll find it for you. It's all right, said Pat. I can wear my old one, but wherever can it be? They looked a little longer, in the hedge and in the long grass at the edge of the field, but they didn't find it, so they all went home to tea. It was Katie who found Pat's hat in the end, but he had to wait a long time for it. It was in the winter when the cornfield was covered in snow. Katie was helping Peter put out fresh straw for the cows. Deep in the middle of another bale, there was Pat's hat, as good as new. Katie shouted just in time to stop Peter from putting his hay fork through the middle of it. He hadn't seen it. She took it into the house and asked Mum for a brush and gave it a good cleaning. What a surprise Pat had when he came with the letters and saw his hat waiting for him. He was very pleased to see it. I was just going to buy another for best, said Pat. Mind you, straw post is a bit slow, but it gets there in the end. Thanks, Katie. Cheerio. And Pat was on his way again. The end. Bye-bye, Mila. Bye-bye, Jack. I'll see you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.